we continue our discussion of indie rock in the 1980s and the idea that in the 1980s, amidst all of the other sort of big MTV, FM radio, um, all of these kinds of sort of um, commercial enterprises, there was developing an alternative, off the radar, independent music kind of community um, that uh, brought music to people uh, in ways that were really, as I, as I keep saying, off the radar from the big, uh, from the, the big music business. Uh, this indie rock scene, in the last video, uh, we talked about hardcore punk and how it played a role in sort of building up kind of regional audiences in a hardcore punk scene across the country in the first half of the decade. But uh, I really want to focus now on the role of college radio and what we call college rock. Remember when we talked about um, the rise of FM radio at the end of the 1960s, we said that AM radio really sort of dominated the popular music business. There was no FM radio. What was on FM radio was classical music, university correspondence courses, maybe some jazz, religious programming, things that most people weren't all that interested in. In fact, most radios didn't even have an FM band to tune these stations in. And when Tom Donahue got the idea of launching FM rock and doing the, what became FM freeform, he called around to church, uh, to church radio stations until he found one that had its phone disconnected, figuring, well, you know, figuring, well, if the phone's been disconnected, they're willing to try anything. And so he starts this FM rock thing, and it's free form, and it begins to catch on, and it becomes what becomes FM rock into the 1970s, and all through this period we're talking about into the 1980s. Well, there was another opportunity like that, just sort of sitting there waiting to be taken advantage of. And that is all these FM rock state, F, all these FM stations that exist at colleges and universities all across the country. Many, many colleges and universities have their own radio stations. Oftentimes, the amount of coverage they get, that is, the, 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 the area which they can broadcast to, is extremely circumscribed. Most of them really are only interested in broadcasting to the, to the campus itself and maybe to the surrounding area where students may be in apartments and that kind of thing. But they're not really interested in broadcasting to an entire community. So they they're tend to be pretty low power stations. But because of that, the students are given pretty free reign in a, lot of, in a lot of colleges and universities, not exactly unsupervised, but they're getting away with a lot of things that probably are against FCC regulations in terms of what they should do. But because hardly anybody can get the signal except people on campus, nobody really is any of the wiser of what goes on. And so what happens there is there's the opportunity to play music that doesn't have anything to do with what's on the charts, that isn't driven by having to sell commercial minutes, that isn't driven by the normal programming uh, constraints and restrictions of NPR or other kind of public broadcasting. Students get to get in there with their own record collections or records that have been sent to the station and just play anything they want and almost say anything they want, and sometimes uh, they do. And so this became a real opportunity for, for college radio to become part of a movement that would bring music that was considered unsuitable for commercial broadcasting um, to a crowd that was looking for something different, something, looking for something that wasn't Bon Jovi, looking for something that wasn't Bruce Springsteen, I don't mean to pick on New Jersey artists, uh, that wasn't Michael Jackson, that wasn't Madonna. Um, and so this is what college radio became. And these, there was a kind of a community of college radio stations that developed across the country. Now college radio, very changeable because students are only in school for four years and you know, you're oftentimes you're changing radio station directors who's a student every year as that student graduates and moves on. But it's a kind of a changing situation, but it's a real opportunity. And what happens is a lot of this independent music, this indie music, gets big on college radio because it's an alternative to what they would normally play, you know, the cars or, 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 or foreign or something like that. And so it's a real opportunity to play music um, that's, that's different. And so it, it, the college radio provides the airplay. And because the, these records are being played on the record, uh, on, the, on the radio station, it also provides possible venues for these groups to come around and do shows. And so there's this whole network of stations and venues among college towns across the country that starts to sort of connect up this off the grid kind of version of popular music, the alternative scene. Uh, the, the sort of, uh, the, the, the best demonstration of this is a group out of Athens, Georgia, um, uh, home of the University of Georgia called REM, uh, led by vocalist Michael Stipe and guitarist Peter Buck, uh, formed in 1980. 
They had five studio albums for an indie label called IRS uh, Records. Their fifth album, Document, from 1987, was like as big a commercial success as you could imagine one of these indie records, uh, record labels being able to produce. I mean, fantastic. It was clear things were, were going, uh, were, were, were really pretty much on the ascent for REM as their music continued to be played and it started to sort of break through into, um, into, into more of a mainstream consciousness. That album, Document from 1987, goes to number 10 in the charts here, number 28 in the UK, uh, powered in part by the single The One I Love, which was a number nine hit. Well. After that fifth album, they left uh, um, IRS Records, uh, in part because they didn't feel like they were getting the kind of um, overseas distribution that they wanted. And so they went with a major label, kind of the cardinal sin in indie rock, going with a major label. A lot of people were very concerned. REM has sold out, now they're going to do a major label. But the reason why they, they signed with Warner Brothers, the big label they signed with was that Warner Brothers said, you've got complete artistic control. You can do whatever you want. So they liked that idea. In 1988, they brought out the album Green. It went to number 12. The song Stand went to number six in the singles charts. And in 1991, they brought the next album with Warner Brothers. The second one was Out of Time, number one in the pop charts here, number one in the UK pop charts, and two big singles, Losing My Religion and Shiny Happy People made R.E.M into international uh, rock stars, uh, emerging out of what had been a really kind of um, relatively unknown kind of underground scene at the beginning of the decade, the beginning of the 1980s when they got started. I can't really talk about all the different kinds of indie groups, so I'm just gonna choose a couple to kind of uh, put a point of emphasis on. Um, coming, for example, out of Massachusetts, we have two groups that, that, that really made a mark, one of them called Dinosaur Junior, coming out of Amherst, Massachusetts, formed in 1984, led by Jay Massis and Lou Barlow. 1987, um, they released the album You're Living All Over Me and a 1988 Bug. Both of those released on SST, remember the, um, the label out of Los Angeles, um, started by the guys in Black Flag. Um, again, a similar pattern. They have, they have some success and they signed to Sire, um, which is a uh, by now, Sire is the, al is the label that had signed a lot of those punk bands back in the late 70s, uh, 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 Blondie and, and some of the rest. Well, in 1991, they bring out the album Green Mind, oh, by, the, by this time, Lou Barlow is out. Another group with a similar kind of trajectory, the Pixies, were formed in Amherst, but later moved to Boston, 1986, led by Frank Black and Kim Deal. Uh, their two albums, Surfa Rosa from 1988 and Doolittle uh, from 1989, were both released on the um, British independent label 4 AD. And in fact, they had some pretty good success in the UK um, where that second album, Doodle, went to number eight in the charts. Another group out of New York that's often thought of as you know, one of the most well, most critically acclaimed bands out of this indie scene, even if they didn't have a fantastic amount of uh, commercial sex, actually, not much commercial success at all, is a group called Sonic Youth, uh, led by Thurston Moore. They were part, initially, of the New York City No Wave <laughs> movement, was a which was a reaction against, punkers were reacting against uh, New Wave. They're often associated with noise rock, but there's an awful lot of avant-garde influences in their music that really kind of harken back maybe to the, the late 60s and the Velvet Underground and a lot of what they were doing together uh, with Andy Warhol. Anyway, uh, Daydream Nation from 1988 uh, is considered a, was considered a great critical success uh, for this group. It's the, it's the album to have if you're going to have just one uh, Sonic Youth record and was praised by all of the indie magazines that sort of followed that scene as being uh, a fantastic success for the group. It was released on Enigma Records, which was an indie label, but like a lot of these groups, they had some su success and then they signed with a major label, in this case, uh, Sonic Youth signing with Geffen. It's probably worth mentioning at least one of the groups from the UK uh, indie scene, and, and if you're going to mention just one group from the UK, you probably have to mention the Smiths, uh, who got played a lot on American college radio. Didn't have a lot of commercial success here, but had tremendous commercial success uh, in the UK, led by Morrissey on vocals and Johnny Marr on guitar. Their 1984 debut album, The Smiths, went to number two in the UK on the strength of the single What Difference Does It Make, a number 12 hit for them. And then the next two albums, again, uh, really big, Meat is Murder from 1985, a number one album in the UK, and The Queen is Dead from 19. 
1986, uh, number two album in the UK. Those albums uh, selling big uh, in the college circuit, and they were uh, sort of along with along with REM, sort of a couple of the real sort of go-to uh, acts for college radio. Actually, uh, in the first half of their career, before they break really big with the Joshua Tree. You too were also sort of the darlings of college radio sort of mid-1980s. So let's take a minute now as we end our lectures for this week to offer a sort of summary of, of, of what we've talked about. First, we've uh, in this week and last week sort of talking about the 1980s. We've talked about how MTV changes the music business in a fundamental kind of way, eventually coming to rival FM radio as a place to break and make uh, new acts and sustain old careers. We see new stars rise during the 80s, but we also see old stars adapt and thrive. So a lot of the 70s acts don't go away. They adapt and continue to thrive in the 1980s, even amidst new artists uh, uh, showing up and having tremendous success. As we've said this week, uh, heavy metal rises, and uh, by the end of the uh, uh, decade, we've got Headbangers Ball on MTV. Rap rises. By the end of the decade, we've got Yo! MTV raps. And indie rock sort of simmers under the surface, getting its own MTV show with 120 minutes. But this indie rock thing will be one of the big connectors to next week's uh, lectures. As we move into the 90s and start to think about what's happening in the 90s, what are the important things in the 90s, it's a little bit harder to look at the 90s right now. We haven't really got as much historical distance as we'd like to have. But there's one thing for sure. This indie rock scene that we've just been talking about launch really sort of leads directly into the launch of the alternative and the grunge scene, which goes really mainstream in the early 1990s, in part fueled by the fantastic success of Nirvana's Nevermind. Nirvana is, in many ways, to alternative music what the Beatles were to the British invasion. Once that album hits, there's a whole flood of these bands that have tremendous success, including a lot of the groups we've been talking about this week who spent part of the 80s living relatively underground. So that's what we'll talk about next week.